This story is about a remarkable young man called Isaac. Always slightly frowning, his deep-set, dark brown eyes seem to be both fully engaged in and alienated from this world. His intriguing questions and introverted energy make him the family's favorite, but only when his giftedness is something to admire more than understand. He adores spending time in nature, connecting with other animals to comfort his sensitive mind, although these nourishing connections are lacking lately. Acquaintances depict Isaac as the next brilliant medical doctor or lawyer. The mere idea that his existence would solely be of value if and when Isaac would adhere to societal expectations triggers a freeze response in him. From a young age, Isaac questions the essence of his existence. Tormented by the shortage of insightful responses from those nearby, most of his life is spent inside philosophical ponderings and scientific discoveries written down by equally intense fellow creatures. He thoroughly tries to understand the problems human beings and other sentient beings are facing. Mere survival, Isaac thinks, is a succession of hardships, and in his many textbooks on the evolution of species, his anxiety is fed by the image of animals surviving at the expense of each other. As you can imagine, Isaac is struck by both a sense of relief and intense horror when he learns about the rising problem of climate change. Human beings should surely be held convictable for creating such a mess, Isaac is convinced. In the meantime, Isaac's mother frequently feels powerless while trying to talk to him. Often he avoids any conversation by retreating to his bedroom for days on end. And lately he will even put up a fierce fight when she tries to enter anyway. By convincing him of the impact of his behavior on his family's well-being, his mother eventually convinces Isaac to speak to a coach. And after speaking to Isaac for a while, his coach decides to approach their so far stiff contact more creatively. Isaac, I have the impression we're not getting anywhere, so I would like you to try out an experimental treatment. I would like you to meet four of my close, close friends. And even though such an approach is unconventional in coaching, I believe you might actually enjoy their company. There's really nothing to lose for Isaac, since he already learned how to relate while not really being present. If this is the coach's way of finding out this won't work, so be it. And so his coach invites them all to meet in a nearby forest, one of the outdoor spaces not yet threatened by industry. At once, three figures seem to notice Isaac's shy presence. On his right, Isaac's attention is caught by a fog of twinkling microparticles moving smoothly as if dancing towards him. Well, hello, my friend. How wonderful we meet at last. I have been traveling from afar. Afar? <laughs> yes, to say the least. You and I might be remarkably familiar with one another, but I haven't met you before. Do you know that in my day and age, we certainly did not expect to develop into moonwalking human beings? Isaac's curiosity is certainly triggered. Well, Isaac replies, what did you expect? Oh, my friend, what a marvelous question, and one I can only answer simply by stating nothing. How does one expect nothing? Well, you see, we always felt like the end of an era, some silver that was left over after a life full of glitter and romance. We, you see, are only the remains from an exploding star. And as we have become identified with this ungracious role, we never expected to land here on Earth, centuries later. And what's more, to become who we have become, an impressive reprocessing of elements, the prerequisites for asteroids, water, the beginning blocks of what you guys call life. Isaac remembers his first discovery of reality's building blocks. He always thought of his exploration of outer space as a distraction from everyday life issues. Now, Mr. Stardust's perspective has awakened him to the realization that we're all made of the same elements, even those leading us into climate disaster. Isaac's defense lessens a bit. Stardust's response has clearly evoked a prying sadness that has softened his heart. Right then, he notices the figure on the left moving towards him and Mrs. Stardust. 
Now, says the figure, while you guys are chatting away here, I've noticed this young lad feeling intensely touched by your life's attitude, Lady Stardust. The tone of this voice charms Isaac, as if this figure speaks from sensitive wisdom rather than presupposed knowledge. Its appearance suggests it's quite young, but its physical form is impressive. A trunk, not very thick, rises up from layers and layers and layers of roots. Who are you? Isaac Darst asks. A survivor, the tree replies, of explosions, ice ages, and heat waves, and now perhaps of the Anthropocene. Partially thanks to Mrs. Stardust over there. Isaac never expected the tree to be retroactively thankful towards reality's building blocks. You know, I've had more than 9,500 years to think about my existence. Now, that may not be as long as Stardust's journey up so far, but long enough to recognize some patterns, don't you think? And as you can see, my life depends deeply on the cloning of life's patterns. What did you learn? Isaac does not hesitate to ask, while the shape of the roots keeps him mesmerized. That even though I have been standing here quite lonely, and I may have survived centuries characterized by different kinds of surroundings and conditions, my existence is still fully dependent on my environment. Isaac thinks this is a rather strange response from a figure like this tree, apparently standing alone, not needing anyone to support him on his fight for survival. Isaac's courage is growing a bit, shown by the way he tilts his face and raises one eyebrow. I see, the tree says, you want to understand. There's more to me than meets the eye. In reality, I'm part of a very old root system that dates back thousands of years. My trunk has died and regrown many times, but my root system has remained intact. It's actually thanks to heavy snow that my low-lying branches touch the earth and take root. New roots sprout from the contact point with the earth. So in this way, you see, it's thanks to weather change and the earth beneath my trunk that I'm still alive after all these years. Likewise, underneath the earth, there's a mega ecosystem of mighty mycelia exchanging communication signals and nutrients between me and my fellow plants. And mind you, your microbiome also depends on similar fungal organisms. I'm sure there's also more to you than meets that daunting gaze. Isaac feels moved by this old, old story of collaborative survival. He thinks about his own roots, how intergenerational connections are, in a sense, a vital source of meaning and perspective for him. An idea that calls to mind his special kind of friendship with his grandfather, how their love for big questions often accompanies their Sunday evening walks during hot summer days. The tree bends towards Isaac and says, don't forget, Earth is a place full of life. Everywhere we look, we can recognize how billions of interactions are but the birth of new forms of life. Remember that your existence always touches upon someone else's. If anything, we're bending the arrow of time simply by being in contact with one another. Isaac is struck by their in-depth conversation, as if he is listening to himself more deeply than he's done in a long time. A delicate smile appears on his face. All this chatter with odd figures seems to be more magical than real. And yet, it is happening and he is part of it as his senses are telling him so. And while the tree keeps swaying from one side to another as if symbolizing a steady facial expression of satisfaction and comfort, the third figure feels called to enter the dialogue. My dear tree friend, it says, how thankful I am for all the leaves you and your friends cordially share with us. A beautiful creature, somewhat stiff in its appearance, smiles gratefully towards the old spruce and then turns his head towards Isaac. Don't you love the shadow and the hiding places that all pal and its wandering branches provides us with on hot summer days? Isaac feels a strange mix of repulsion and fascination. This creature's contrasting black and yellow colors are certainly captivating, but its demeanor and pale eyes seem to suggest he keep safe distance. Yes, Isaac says hesitatingly, it's my favorite reading site. Oh, what a coincidence, you're also a loner. 
a few sentences into the conversation, and Isaac feels a strange intimacy with her. His own reaction to this creature mirrors other people's reactions to Isaac. You know, for a long time, I've not felt quite understood by your fellow human beings. All sorts of stories are projected on my tribe. This misunderstanding is captured expressively by my name, Salamandra Salamandra, also known as Fire Salamander. For a long time, people thought that my beings were immune to fire. In medieval myths, fire salamanders provide protection from fire. The irony is, in reality, we did test temperatures above 20 degrees Celsius, since we rely on our environment to regulate our body temperature. Some of the myths rose out of the fact that fire salamanders used to hide in the wood blocks people used for their fireplaces. Once they threw these blocks in the fire, they saw the hidden salamanders flee and imagined they were born from the fire. Isn't that a funny misconception? So you don't feel anger for being misunderstood? I've come to the conclusion that human beings need quite a lot of time to truly understand their environment. And really, this can only elicit empathy from my side, since you guys have been around for such a brief time. We certainly have had more time to understand your nature, and we've noticed that you have a thing for fictional stories you hang on to much longer than the context demands for. Long after wood has expired as your main source of heating, you're actually in dire need for new energy resources, this myth has persisted. Wouldn't you be interested in telling a different kind of story? What if this forest would not be considered a pile of wood, but a sacred grove? Well, Isaac says, entertained by the inquisitive nature of the conversation, I can actually tell you a little fact you might enjoy. Salamandra salamandra refers to the Persian word samandar. Sam stands for fire, and andarun means inside. Oh, how eloquently you know your languages, the salamander responds and chanted. Isaac laughs spontaneously and then becomes a bit overwhelmed. Suddenly, he feels he needs to protect himself in front of this uncanny familiar being. What the heck does this all mean, really? As questions pop up, he wants to leave the strange scene, but freezes to the ground. Sensitive Mrs. Stardust flies to his left side, asking, Now tell us, what about your inner fire? Her question reminds him of all the times the people around him misunderstand his needs, what he generally loves doing and what he thought he could become. At this point, the coach's last friend enters the scene from above. Dear friends, how lovely to see you grouped together. I noticed someone freezing over here and felt instantly drawn. Oh, Isaac stutters, that must have been me. Yes, yes, don't worry. Eventually, we will all melt into new yet recognizable forms. <laughs> In every dimension, the shape of this figure repeats itself infinitely. Isaac remembers his own drawings of clouds as a young child. Amazingly, there did not seem to be a child in the world misrepresenting clouds. This captured Isaac's attention, since there were so many details that other children never were able to picture in a way similar to Isaac's rather evolved visual intelligence. Did I interrupt your conversation? The cloud asked thoughtfully. Yes, Stardust replies. I just asked this young man to tell us more about his inner fire. Ah, your personal signature, I can tell you a bit about this. Do not be afraid you won't find your inner fire. It's in everything that you do, that you feel, that you think. You know, nature is made up of complex patterns that repeat themselves at infinitum. Regardless of how much we zoom in on who you are, your inner fire will be expressed by every single cell. The only thing that you have to do is to be yourself. This way, you will be so self-similar that you will certainly express yourself just the way you are. The metaphysics of his answer made Isaac remember the beauty of fractal-like nature. It was as if his mind was opened once again by the higher order insight of which this cloud reminded him. Isaac feels grateful. It is clear to him that he needed to take a step away from his personal perspective, feel connected with being more than a human being, to actually sense his unique humanity again. While a tear falls from his cheek, the cloud dissipates into heart-relieving rain, stardust finally fully falls to the ground, washed away by the rain, and the trunk of the tree erodes almost completely. 
Change is always happening. Meanwhile, in the forest, the temperature has dropped significantly. After some time passes, his coach walks into the forest, suggesting they make a campfire together. While throwing wood logs on top of one another, Isaac notices the fire salamander fleeing hastily into the forest, climbing up a nearby tree. Tell me, Isaac, how was your meeting? In a strange way, every single encounter has made me remember who I am. It made me remember, in the sense that I feel connected once more to both all human and all non-human. You know, I have a dream. I have the dream that human beings will take into account multi-species well-being. I have to dream that we invest our ability for empathy, creativity, and compassion into the understanding and representation of our interconnection with everything non-human. That we give voice to all species, a diversity of human and non-human voices which highlights the active participation of all species in one another's well-being. My personal development must be connected to the well-being of other sentient beings. I now see that all of life is sentient in its own mysterious ways, and I want to teach others these insights. Maybe I knew all along, maybe I just did not dare to share this wisdom. There's not much time left, but the giftedness of our natural world deserves my full devotion. This is not solely about fulfilling my potential, nor solely about survival. This is about acknowledging the value of life at every, even unimaginably tiny or grand scale. Life is such an exceptionally living thing. We should continuously strive to understand the interests of other species, learn to be responsive towards those indicators that tell us how our environment is doing. We must adapt our behavior wisely and be in dynamic balance with nature. A common concern for the whole community should be the inspiration for our developing value system. My eyes are not yet accustomed to this reopened perception. I will have to experiment repeatedly. With every action, this new perception will be tested and fine-tuned. I will have to struggle existentially and learn along the way how to recognize other voices in this new language in the making. Okay, Isaac, now go out into the world and be your wonderful, gifted, interconnected self. And before Isaac even says goodbye, he runs into the forest, disappearing in the wood white web. <laughs>